and welcome back to another episode of Beyond the To-Do List. I'm your host, Eric Fisher, and this is the show where I talk to the people behind the productivity. This week, I'm excited to share with you a conversation that I recently had with author Cal Newport, author of the book, Deep Work. Cal's been on the show before. This time we do some deep work and dive deeper into the book Deep Work and the concept of deep work. One of the great things is to be able to sit down and talk with Cal about some of the things that people have objection-wise when it comes to deep work, their hang-ups of why they think they can't do it, or some of the nitpicky details of when they've read the book or heard others talk about it. They say, can deep work really work for me? And we uncover the answers when it comes to those questions in this conversation. Before we get into that conversation, I want to make a quick disclaimer that there was a slight audio issue with his microphone early in the conversation, but then it fixes. So if you can hold tight and stay tuned for the really awesome content and forgive me the slightly less high quality audio for about the first third of the conversation, I know you will be well rewarded for listening to this conversation with Cal Newport. Well, this week, it is my privilege to welcome back to the show, Cal Newport. Cal, welcome back. Eric, I'm glad to be back. A lot of people probably only know of one or two of your books, but you got many books. Yeah, that's right. I have uh, what five books, but the the first three are aimed at students, and I wrote them while I was a student. So that there is an over... Here's the thing. Here's how I know I'm getting old. Uh, The the students who read my student books, which I wrote as a student, are now older (laughs) and in the working world and reading my books... So the same students that say, oh, I read your book in high school and now I'm using deep work in my job. Nothing makes me feel older than hearing that, but <laughs> I guess it's, it's still good to hear they're sticking around. Now that I'm thinking about it, those books that you wrote as a student for students, really, you've continued to write for students. It's just adult students in the career area. And it's kind of a through line, I think. It, yeah, it's a through line. It's also a through line just because it sinks to my, my stage in life. When I was a student, I was writing books on students. When I was entering the job market, I wrote a book about career satisfaction. When I got a professorship and needed to figure out how to get tenure, I wrote a book on how do you perform really excellent work in a distracted age. So basically, the books just follow essentially where I'm going in life. So there's this this particular sub-audience I have of people who kind of followed me, who are my age, and have followed me along. And, and we have a really nice thing going because they've been able to, to stick with me. As I grow and as the issues I care about change, they change for them as well. But I think most people, you know, they, and again, when I when your name is mentioned, they're like, oh, yeah, deep work. Like yeah. the most recent book, again, most recent being two years ago now. So some people are like yeah, me included wondering, hey, what's your next thing? I'm in line as soon as it's available for pre-order. So, well, hey, you're in luck. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think my 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 next book which comes out in February. It's on Amazon now. Oh so wow! You can sort of see the see the cover, hear the description, pre-order you know copies for your entire extended family and all your colleagues. <laughs> 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 but so you can't you can actually find out a little bit more about what I'm up to next, and that's that's a recent that's kind of a recent change. Cool. Well, I'm sure it's you know it, again if it's in the thread that continues to move forward. In the meantime, there's a lot of people who again they hear your name, they think deep work, and then they think yeah, but. And then they start to go off into these tangents of why they can't. And and really, it's not a tangent. It's more excuses. I wanted to dig into that a little bit this time around. But before we do that, let's, for anybody who's not heard the conversation we had last time, let's do a really quick synopsis of what deep work is and kind of what that looks like. Right. That's probably a good idea. So, so who I am is I'm a, I'm a computer scientist. I'm a technologist who writes about the, impact of technology on cultures. There's kind of a few big ideas that I write about. And one of the big ideas is captured in this book, Deep Work, which at its core is the idea that the ability to focus intensely without distraction for a long period of time, this ability to focus intensely, what I call deep work, is something that we're vastly underestimating its value right now in our economy. That we're, we're prioritizing all sorts of other types of activities that are just significantly less value producing than the ability to focus intensely. And my claim, which I call the deep work hypothesis, is that this gives a sort of unfair outsized advantage or opportunity for those rare individuals and organizations who are willing to systematically cultivate that skill. That if you are really good at focusing intensely right now, especially in the knowledge sector, you are going to have a massive advantage, which I think, by the way, is going to go away. I I think the, the sector is going to get more efficient. It's going to realize the value. But right now we're in this wonderful moment 
or terrible moment, depending on your perspective, <laughs> where we're really, uh, we're really underestimating forgetting how valuable it is to be able to focus intensely. The underestimation of it, I think, is maybe, again, where some of the people, they just don't realize when they are introduced to this concept, they think, oh, so really you're just saying, I just need to learn to focus. But that's cutting it really, really short. That's really oversimplifying it because it's much more than that. It's really by being able to dedicate time and intention and attention all at the same time, that's where that better work comes from. And people are so used to doing a lot of shallow work uh, that they don't realize that the deep work is even possible. Yeah. And, and I think people, we, we've gotten, we're almost so irrational in how we're approaching work in the knowledge sector in, in uh, particular is that it's making it hard for people to realize there's another way. So it's not just that we're a little bit out of whack in our ratio of concentration, not concentration. It's that we've, we've created jobs in which people are doing only the non-concentrated shallow work. So, so we're so far out of whack right. that they don't even know, well, what are we talking about? But in almost any skilled knowledge work position, it is intense concentration that moves the needle. It's what makes you better at things. It's what produces things that value. It's what you can do with your brain that is hard for others who don't have the same experience and training to replicate. And yet, most people are spending most of their time doing very easily replicatable activities, usually centered on routing information around. So they're answering, answering emails, receiving emails, they're, they're doing chats, they're going to meetings, they're uh, interacting on social media. None of those things are hard to replicate. None of those use hard one skills or experience. And therefore, the amount of value they're creating is necessarily from a market oriented perspective going to be low. It's the intense concentration that moves the needle. It's, it's what uh, doubles revenue. It's what gets you promoted. It's what makes you great at something that's really valued. And it's just shocking the degree to which people can go through most of their day not doing that core activity. And I like to say, like, if you're doing something that a, a 19 year old can be trained to do in a couple of weeks, like answer an email or set up a meeting or, or tweet on social media, you can't expect that's actually generating a lot of value in your professional life. And so I've been this real advocate that focus is one of the killer skills of our current highly competitive knowledge economy. It's hard to do. You have to train it. You have to fight to make room for it in your schedule. You have to fight to protect it from encroaching forces. But it is so valuable you can't ignore it. And that's something that's very hard for people who have done deep work and do enough deep work to have that great work, you know, under their belt. And they continue to do it moving forward. But at the same time, work inside of social media and part of their, uh, I don't know, marketing plan or whatever you want to call it, their attention is not just about the work itself. It's also about access to the, the person, the brand, the, you know, the et cetera, which again, you don't have because you're not on social media at all and never have been, which is shocking to me and still very interesting and, and almost admirable, really. When it comes to social media, we tend to, uh, when we're talking about vastly overestimating or underestimating things. I, I think our business culture in particular uh, vastly overestimates the value of a lot of social media activities. There, there, we, we do this weird extrapolation in both our professional and personal lives where it'll, it'll be something like this. Like, here is something I came up with that is valuable about, let's say, using Facebook. It's, it's value is greater than zero. Therefore, uh, the fact that I use this on my phone two hours a day is justified. <laughs> we make these leaps or in business. <laughs> like it, it is true. Like if you are like on uh, Twitter a lot, that you will be engaging with people more than if you weren't. So its value is strictly greater than zero. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you can extrapolate to that, that I should be using Twitter all day because in a lot of sort of elite knowledge work type professions, especially creative type professions, that could actually cripple your ability to create value, which is vastly more important than people getting your hot take on uh, whatever's going on. And so I, I, I see this about social media in our society, uh, in our per professional lives and personal lives, is that we have this weird uh, threshold mentality. Of if I can think of any benefit, then then I no longer have to think about the role of this thing in my life. I can just open the gate, let it in, and let it just take over, let it, let it metastasize, take over my time. I don't have to be critical about it once I can identify any, uh, any particular benefit. Where I feel like if we accurately recalibrated the benefits of social media, what you would see is there would be many more people who don't use it at all, and those who do would be using it in a, a significantly less intrusive way than they are right now. There's not something inherently wrong with 
technology. Let's put it that way. Social media, on the other hand, maybe so, especially with the, you know, like, like you talk about and I know is definitely true is the addictive designed in baked in addictive nature of social media apps, especially the of the mobile variety. But even like, for example, a while ago, Johnny Ive talking about when he's asked about, you know, how things have changed the world. And, you know, he says there's there's wonderful use and then there's misuse. And then they say, wait, what do you mean by misuse? And he says, perhaps constant use. And it's just like even the guy who's designing Apple stuff says constant use of Apple stuff could be really bad for you. Which, Steve, by the way, I have to interject because it, so I get into a lot of this in that new book that, that you know, I'm coming out in February called Digital Minimalism, which is really about like radically rethinking the role of technology in your personal life. So I've done a lot of work on this recently. And one of the things I did is I tracked down and talked to one of the original members of the iPhone team who, who worked directly with Jobs on the development of the iPhone. And what he confirmed is that when, when they were developing the iPhone, the original release back in 2007, it was never Jobs' vision that this was something that you were supposed to use and check all the time. And the, the original, in fact, remember, there's no apps, no third-party apps, uh, and, and this was on purpose. And as, as this designer told me, uh, Jobs was very worried about this idea that you would just let like other people's applications run on your phone. He said, yeah, it's going to crash the phone right when you need to call 911. <laughs> That's going to be the end of the iPhone, right? He, there's no app, so there's no app. If you go back and look at the original uh, keynote introducing the iPhone, you have to get 30 minutes into that keynote before he talks about messaging or internet. The, the, the whole idea was this is a better phone. The interface is better. You don't have these little buttons. The voicemail is better. And it combines the iPod on the phone. So you no longer have to have a phone in a night, which was a big problem back then. You don't have okay. to have an iPhone in it. And that was the whole thing. It was like this, uh, phones are great. I can make the phone interface work better and I can get your songs on there. Like that was, so uh, the whole idea of the iPhone, for example, was never that you're going to check it 85 to 100 times a day as is now standard. So it's, it's surprising to the, to the extent to which technologies that people brought into their life were relatively minor or casual reasons change the rules of engagement once they're in your world. And I don't think we're, we're as alarmed about that as we should be. We, instead, what we do is we just work backwards and, and try to justify, well, this must have been the idea all along. But people didn't originally buy smartphones to check them all the time. People didn't sign up for Facebook in 2005 because they wanted to spend 50 minutes a day glancing at it. Like People did these things for minor and casual reasons, and then their role in our life changed and they ended up changing our life they ended up commandeering our attention uh, affecting how we feel what we do what we pay attention to they've had these outside rules that no one signed up for and so I, I often say this is the discussion it's not is this useful or useless of course there's uses for all these things no one would buy them otherwise the question is about autonomy it's autonomy not usefulness to what degree do you feel like you're losing more and more control over your cognitive life in ways that that you're not happy about and that plays right into, you know, then Zuckerberg talking about people spending less time on Facebook, but their goal being to make it more meaningful time that he talks about using social media to connect with people. And then that correlates to, you know, long term well-being and like happiness and health, which is funny because I think that studies basically say it's the opposite. The more you use it, the worse your happiness and, and health are. And well, here, so I've, I've, yeah, so I know those studies well. I, I went into them for the new book. I can, so I can tell you what's going on because I, I spent a lot of time with them. Um, basically, the pro Facebook studies, which almost all, by the way, have uh, are funded by and have a Facebook research scientist as a co-author. So you know, <laughs> keep that asterisk in mind because what they do is Facebook will give their research scientists access directly to Facebook platforms. They can do research that's hard for other people to do. Um, but anyways, the ones that find pro-Facebook benefits, what they're almost always doing is that they're isolating a specific behavior in a sort of contrived scenario. So they'll say, let's, let's, um, let's isolate, like right now, let's have you essentially share something with a friend on Facebook. And they'll say, look, that made you a little bit happier than if you had instead in that time not done that. Right. So if you isolate some particular behaviors on Facebook, now even the Facebook scientists say uh, you only get a benefit from behaviors that are about interacting with people you know well. So broadcasting information, reading, like retweeted you know, things that people that you don't know are sharing, that, like, that type of stuff does not make people happy. But in isolation, sure, if I sit here in a room alone or I sit here in a room and I like, type a comment to uh, a good friend of mine, I, I get a little benefit out of that. 
On the other hand, we have all this research that's very well done research coming out of very top places saying that, you know, the more people use this, the less happy they get. The, it's very clear. It's controlled for all sorts of different types of, of relevant demographic variables. The more you use things like Facebook, the less happy you are. So what's going on? Uh, what's actually happening, as far as we can tell, is that uh, social media, when people are using more social media, it's not that the specific thing they're necessarily doing in the moment is making them unhappy if they are using it to say interact with a friend, but it takes away time from other types of activities. In particular, it tends to take people's time away from actual analog, real interaction. And so it's uh, the more time you spend on there, the less time you do the type of interaction that were evolved to do the sort of high bandwidth, you know, I'm talking to someone back and forth interactively with all the nuances and information and connection. And it's the, the reduction of that that's making people miserable. So that, that's what's going on with that research, basically. Is they're saying like, hey, we isolated it. If you leave a comment on a friend, you're going to be happier than if you just sit alone. Sure, that's true. But if you spend all evening leaving comments on friends in your room as a teenager, instead of actually being out with them at a party and in some trouble, you're going to be miserable. And I, I think that's what's, what's, been, what's being captured by this research. Yeah. And, and I have to agree with that because I know for a fact that there are different levels or different, um, I don't know, categories in a way of my friends. Not that I put all my friends in categories, but because <laughs> that sounds just really cold and calculated. I, I've got friends who... Uh, right now, my closest friends are not the ones that I'm interacting on social media with. They're the ones where, yes, we're still using technology to stay in touch. Like a friend of mine uh, sent a link to a YouTube video that we were talking about yesterday at a coffee shop in person. He said, yeah. hey, uh, he sent it to us, you know, in a text message. So we're still using technology, but we're not conducting the majority of our relationship in an online public fashion. Yes. And I have this idea, conversation-centric approach to friendship, which basically says the research is pretty clear. I mean, maybe this is kind of The research is pretty clear is that if you want to maximize the sort of social satisfaction you have in your life, really what you should do is think about technology like social media and text messages as its primary role is just in helping the logistics of setting up real interaction. And that don't count interaction that happens in social media comments or on text message threads. Don't count that as an actual interaction with the person. That its only value in your social life should be, hey, okay, I'm at the coffee shop now. Or, hey, are you around? I'm in town. Can you, can you, you know, like setting up interactions, you know, hey, I'm going to be in town. Let's, let's, let's hone in on the same place so we can meet. But only counting analog communication, phone calls, video calls, and in-person interaction as actual socializing. The effect of that is, is, yes, there will be a lot of people who leave your social orbit because you do have this sort of uh, these, these longer, these longer, larger orbits of people who you only interact with online. And if you, if you no longer use social media or text messages to maintain relationships, you will lose some of those. But the richness of having analog communication far outweighs it. And so I've become an advocate of that. It's the technology when it comes to interaction and social life is mainly useful for helping you to better support and have a more active in-person social life. Yes, exactly. Like it, it's, <laughs> I always use this when I talk about technology, essential, and I, I always do this. I go back to Iron Man. I basically say, look, Tony Stark is Tony Stark, and then he puts the Iron Man suit on and he can do more, but he's still Tony Stark. So, you know, it, it's, it's just by adding that one extra technological layer of superpower to him. But even without the suit, he still has superpowers to a certain extent, which is his intellect, his personality, you know, his perspective, all those things. Yeah, yeah, I think that I think that is absolutely true. And the way I, so this philosophy I preach now called digital minimalism is basically saying you got to start with you. And in particular, you have to start with what is important to me? What do I value? Like, what are the things I really value and think these are the cores? These things are the cores to, to a, a meaningful and satisfying life. You got to figure that out. Once you figure that out, what role does technology play? Well, you can take these things you value and ask the question, what is the, the way that I can use technology best to help support this value? Let me find like a way to use technology for each of these values where maybe the biggest swing, the biggest impact I can have. So you're sort of strategically deploying technology to support these core values and then ignore the rest of the crap. Like that's enough. Like if you, if you have the things you deeply value and you have some highly optimized, big win uses of technology to Iron Man style boost up those things mm -hmm. you really value, uh, you are going to have a very meaningful, satisfying life. And it's a much different mindset than I think what most people are doing right now with technology in their life, which is to adopt the maximalist mindset, which is, you know, if I can think of any value for this thing, I should probably let into my life. 
And that is a, a disastrous mindset, especially when it comes to these very, very powerful technologies of the internet age. If you just casually go around and say, oh, that might be cool, let me put this in, that might be cool, let me put this in, you are going to lose uh, the reins of your life here. You're going to lose the sort of autonomous ability to try to craft something that's meaningful. So I, I like that Iron Man analogy because basically that's the way that I found people are most happy in our current sort of technological world is those who say, I am 100% clear about what I value and I deploy technology to get those things more or to strengthen my ability to pursue, pursue those things. I could care less if you say, you might be missing out on some little value by not being on this service because what I care about much more is taking the things that I already know for a fact are really valuable and making sure I'm getting as much of that as possible in my life. You know, it's almost like paying for going into a buffet and then saying, well, they have all these things, so I better make sure I eat one of everything. Yeah, you're not going to end up nearly as happy <laughs> as that. if you're like, I got some good things I like to eat. I think one of the other key things here is having that perspective allows it to then be approached from more of a controlled use instead of a compulsive use. In other words, it cuts back on the addiction probability. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. Um, like with social media, for example, just there, there's no one, unless you own a significant amount of Facebook stock, there's no reason to have any of these applications on your phone. That That is 100% about addictive use. And so I, I'm yet to hear a, a sort of solid use case for social media that can't be satisfied with you logging on on your desktop computer a few times a week to do X, Y, Z. I need to, whatever, check in on this Facebook group that's really important. I need to post, you know, uh, to my audience my latest post or this or that. There's, there's essentially no reason to have social media on your phone, right? And so and there's little things like that that, that can make a, a huge difference. So I'll have to say I've evolved some, you know, in deep work I talked about, let's just take everything and do a cost-benefit analysis, which I still agree with, but I, I, I think about it more through this, this sort of minimalism uh, lens of even more importantly, say, no, 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 here's the things that are I value the most in my work, and here's the things I value the most in my personal life, and I want to have a really good technological boost for each of these things, but once I have that, I'm fine. And I don't necessarily need to go and evaluate every new thing that comes in. Like, unless something comes into my radar that I says, oh, this could be much better than what I'm already using to boost like X, Y, or Z that I find really valuable. You can, you can more healthily uh, ignore it. You don't have to be an ad hoc technology reviewer. It's, it's not your job to have to look at every social media app and think about it. Should I use it or should I not? It's know it's valuable, pursue those things, use technology to help those values in some very optimized way and be happy with that. And unless something really breaks through, like it's going to be transformative and for something you value, you, you don't even have to bother with the evaluation. In other words, I'm, I've become much more minimalist on this. You, you, you figure out what's important, optimize those things in your life, and go after it. You know, get after it, and don't don't be so caught up in this uh, kind of perpetual consumer mode of well, what about this? Is there a little value out of this? Is there a little value out of that? And then that's sort of what I've done. And like with social media in my professional life, I know what's important in my professional life. I use technology in some very strategic ways to help that. And and social media, like many other technologies, has just not passed that bar of like this could be transformative uh, to those things that I value. So I just don't bother with it. So one of the things that I think a lot of people are going to have issue with, you've been a best-selling author and haven't needed to use social to push your stuff. And to that, they'd be like, no, that's not true. You've got to have social, but you're doing great work and the great work is speaking for itself, which I think kind of proves your point. This has been my experience. I mean, what sells is good stuff. And so in, in the job marketplace, if you're good at something really valuable, you'll have interesting job opportunities. In the writing space, if you're writing good things, people will want to buy it. Now, I don't know what the differences would be. If you take a book like Deep Work, there's a, a relatively, you know, there's a slow ramp up and, and now it's sold a ton of copies, but it's, it had the spread. I had to let word of mouth spread over time and maybe it would have been a little bit faster if I had a large social media following or maybe not. But in the long run, I mean, the, the, the best I can tell in writing is that if you're incredibly engaged with a platform, the main advantage you get is you might be able to get 20% more to 30% more sales in that initial week because you can mobilize an audience better. But those initial week sales really just pale in comparison to the overall number of sales that, that you hope to achieve with a successful book. So it's really a bit of a drop in the bucket. And then you have to really worry, but wait a second, if I, in order to get this boost, like when my book first comes out, I have to be constantly engaged on social media. What impact would that have on either the quality of my book or at the speed at which I'm able to write the books? And so then you may end up in a much 
worse situation. If you're, uh, I mean, I see this more and more now with, with nonfiction writers, they're more in an advice space. This, this, this idea that like the way they have to write books is wait till it's six weeks before the deadline and then go into like frenzied monk mode that try to push out 10,000 words a day or whatever they're doing, which is a terrible way to write anything thoughtful. Uh, but I think a lot of that has to do with sort of our, our current social media shallow work age is that, you know, People are distracted and they're uncomfortable with concentration. And so you probably this is the trade off you're making. If you're very engaged with an audience, you're potentially writing worse books or below you're punching below your weight class because of, of what you have to give up to do that. And so for me, that calculus has always made sense. I'm worried about things that can make a persistent claim to my attention. So I don't mind a blog. I have a lot of reasons I like my blog. And one of them is there's nothing for me to check. It's not on my phone. There's nothing for me to check. It can't distract me. I write a blog post. I do it. I put it out there. That's that. Uh, and so I'm very wary about things that could have a persistent claim on my attention because I need my attention to do things like come up with the ideas and write the books in the first place. And what you're describing is also the fact that essentially, like Ryan Holiday talks about in Perennial Seller, is that you have one on your hands with deep work. It's gradually becoming one of those cult classics, You know, one of those movies that you know, it came out like It's a Wonderful Life or Shawshank Redemption didn't do great in the box office, but then slowly was discovered to be very important work. Yeah, this is my model. And <laughs> maybe I'm being glib about it, but I think it's a great <laughs> model. You, you try to write things that really have a good idea, really well thought through. I spend a long time writing my books, right? That's part of it. It's not it, it, It's not bullet points and let me get this out in six weeks. And ideas, I think, are important and hit the cultural moment um, and that that have the ability to maybe change something about someone's life. If you can change something about someone's life, they'll tell other people about it. So yeah, deep work just sort of sits there in the background and sells. You know, I have this book I wrote uh, for students called How to Become a Straight-A Student, but it was kind of the same idea. I wrote it in 2006, it came out. Uh, no promotion, no publicity, but this thing has sold over 100,000 copies. It just sits there and sells because no one had written a book like this before in the student market that was just really specific and no nonsense about here are the actual ways to study and take notes and and, and write papers if you want to do really well. This is what the, the real students do. It's, it's hard, but it's also very specific. And I'm just going to tell you how to do it with not without fluff. And no one had written a book like that. And I, I wrote it and I wrote it carefully and it sells as much this year as it did 10 years ago. And so I like Ryan's perennial seller for exactly that reason, because that's my strategy. And it's a strategy that keeps me off my phone. So I don't mind it. A lot of people have been influenced by the book Deep Work. So, for example, even Michael Hyatt said to me, they have created an, a planner. It's a paper planner. It's a hardbound paper planner. And it was inspired by your work and, you know, the distractions of the digital environment. And so I'm interested then to see what does your technology toolbox look like when it comes to productivity? Well, there, there's systems and then the tools to implement the systems, and they don't. Uh, one doesn't necessarily specify the other. So, if if we look at, uh, so I'll tell you my professional systems briefly and what tech I currently use to support those systems, but then emphasize that other tech could be used to support the same systems. So, in my professional life, I'm a I'm a big believer in daily, weekly, temporary planning. So, you have three different scales of planning. You have a plan for the current day which is time blocked, not a to-do list, but time blocked. This is what I'm doing during these hours. And then for the next 20 minutes, I'm doing this. And then for four hours, I'm doing this. Uh, then I have a weekly plan that really lays out the plan for the week. Okay, this is what's happening on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, the level of detail in that plan can vary depending on what's going on. So some days, if there's a lot of moving parts in terms of like meetings and appointments, those weekly plans could have pretty detailed notes about what's happening each day. Other times, let's say if I'm writing, it could be very like non-detailed. Hey, I'm just writing today with a one hour shallow work block whenever I end. And then temporary plans are, these are basically plans that uh, exist at a scale above a week that you put in place as needed for particular things. So if you have a big deadline coming up in a couple months, you might have a temporary plan that's like, let me talk about like what we're going to do week by week to, to make sure we're there in time. We need to make sure that whatever, we have this done by this point. Or um, if you're organizing a conference, right? So basically plans that exist above the scale of a week that give you a sense of how am I laying out my energy on the scale of like weeks and months. And so I have those three plans. And so you make the temporary plans as needed. You make the weekly plans every every week. And then your daily plan is, is basically influenced by the weekly plan. And that's what you execute. 
how you actually implement those, what technology you use, um, is highly variable. What I like to do now is I use a, a paper notebook for the daily plan. Paper is a, a fantastic analog technology because it requires no batteries, it's very legible, and it's incredibly customizable in terms of how you capture information because you can just write freehand on it. You can draw arrows to this or cross this out or redraw this over here or circle this or put a star here. It gives you many more options than a lot of technologies in which you're being more constrained that I have to you know, fit things into text boxes on a screen. Uh, for my, my weekly plan, I'm a a, a big believer in blank text files. I think text files are great. It's not quite as flexible as paper because you can't draw, but I love the flexibility of just a rich text format text file where I can bold this, make lists, write longhand, put a big paragraph here, put a quick bullet point list without being forced into a structure. So I tend to type those up and I print them. And then uh, as they change throughout the week, I might, might update it and print out a new ones. And then for the temporary plans, I also just write those in uh, text and I tend to keep those for whatever legacy reasons. I'll actually keep those in my email inbox. And so when I see that every day, I'll sort of see the temporary plans or see it every week. But then again, you could really, you know, I, I know people, you could use like a bullet planner system to store those things, or you could put it all electronically. So the tech can vary. Uh, that's just a particular tech I use to support this, these systems. And of course, when you're talking about working with those text files, you are using a computer. You're not sitting there hand drawing them. Yeah, I love plain. I used to have this article once about plain text productivity. Uh, it, you know, I I like typing things because my handwriting is not great, but I love flexibility. And there's nothing to me better than Mac text edit when it comes to laying out a plan. A blank, rich text format text edit screen is a canvas on which you can lay out really detailed, interesting types of in, interesting types of plans. I get a really big kick out of the fact that then you're printing it out and then it's paper again anyway. <laughs> Well, because I can go – depending on what I'm doing, I mean I can go a long time without touching a computer. So I don't, I don't want to be – I don't want to uh, – you know, unlike a lot, of, a lot of people's workflows, mine is not built around sort of reacting to information on a computer. I can go hours and sometimes days without looking at a computer. So it's important for me to have these things, and I work on foot a lot and switch locations. So it's important I can have these things with me without having to, to be on the internet. So for a lot of people out there, they're hearing this and they're saying, that's just unheard of. I could never do that. And surprisingly, they probably don't understand that they probably could. But I think then what really gets them is not the productivity angle of your use of technology, but the personal angle. So for example, like we can branch out from here, but I know that you just recently uh, had another child. And so most people, you know, their social media feeds or, you know, sending pictures and emails and different things like that. That's what their technology use looks like when it comes to that. But I got to ask, what's yours look like when it comes to that? Um, oh, with the with the new the new child. Yeah, <laughs> um, pretty minimal. I mean, uh, so we, we had our third child and we just we had lots of family come through lots of families visiting uh we spent a lot of time you know friends coming through i know I, we just we saw and spent a lot of time with a lot of family in those first few months the role of technology i guess my wife sent out an email you know announcing the baby i traditionally do a blog post whenever you know this is my third study mm -hmm. act blog post on a new child i'll send like to my parents or my siblings sometimes i'll send pictures on a text message uh but yeah technology played not a major role <laughs> in the arrival of the new kid and and i have to say it felt like an incredibly sort of uh connected social experience and uh very little of it was mediated through a screen mm-hmm well, and it goes back to what we were talking about earlier with the relationships and how a social media, I don't know, activity that, again, it, it should be in – not it should. If you're going to use it, let's put it that way. If you're going to use social media, that it should be used not to fully support a relationship or a friendship or wh whatever you want to call it, in our social interactions. It can be part of it, but it can't be the full-on support like structure for it. Yeah. And I, my, my theory is don't count it, right? Like if, if, if you say like, I've only interacted with this person the last year, uh, through social media or text messages, you should just treat that in your head as I haven't interacted with this person in the last year. It's to say like, I haven't seen them. And so, you know, either I need to get my act together and find a way to get them on the phone or on FaceTime or go out there and do something in person, or I need to just recognize this isn't really 
a, a good friend of mine. I haven't, I'm not, I haven't interacted with them. Uh, and this is, this is somewhat an extreme use. So take this with a grain of salt, but let's just throw it out there. Once you allow that, it's just a different form of interaction. It, you know, sometimes you interact online, sometimes you interact in person. It almost inevitably starts to crowd out the, the, the in-person actual real interactions because it's just easier. And the research is so clear that it's just, it's, not even in the same league of providing what we need as human beings. It just does not hit the same buttons. Our brain is not evolved to see like a little comment, like text pop up or a, a heart on Instagram and treat it as any sort of actual interaction of the type that we, that we really crave. And so communication technology, you know, it hates logistics. It makes it so much easier than it used to be to, to set things up. They get people, hey, when, when can I call you around tonight? It's so much easier than just having to call someone out of the blue, but it doesn't replace analog communication. I mean, it should be a very small percentage of the total, if any. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So since we're talking about, you know, social interactions and friends and coworkers and all that, deep work can be seen as something that is done by yourself all alone. And that might be one of the other objections that people have to it where they say, well, I'm an extrovert. Like deep work isn't for me because I got to get out and like sit down and work with people. So how do you maybe have a counter to people who say deep works for introverts, not for us extroverts? Well, there's nothing intrinsic about deep work that requires you to be in isolation. What deep work is, is the activity where you're focusing very intensely on something that's cognitively demanding. So something I, I talk about briefly in the book is uh, what I call the whiteboard effect, which is really well known, for example, in like academic circles uh, where I run, which is this idea that actually if you're sitting down with a small group trying to tackle a hard problem together, almost certainly each of you is going to achieve more intense concentration and produce better outcomes than if you were alone because when you're when you're working with other people in person, on something cognitively demanding, it's much harder to allow yourself to wander or to to power down your concentration or let you you know the look at email, look at your phone because there's social pressures. Okay, let me let me take the proverbial blackboard you know chalk and let me take a stab at getting this equation right. If I don't pay attention to that, uh, I let my mind wander, then it's going to be embarrassing. I have to say, you know what, you have to go back and do it again. I wasn't concentrating. You know, there's some social ramifications. So this is something well known among people like uh, academics that do very intense type like math proofs is that doing deep work in a group is often more intense than trying to do it with yourself because it's just too easy when you're by yourself to be like, well, what if I just looked at email real quick to, to, to sabotage it? So there's nothing intrinsically solitary about deep work. And in fact, doing deep work with others is something that I that I uh, encourage. Programmers know this too. You know, the, the whole the whole notion behind pair programming originally was supposed to be it was going to catch bugs better. Um, but part of the reason why it's effective where it is effective is because it also uh, gets more intense or more sustained concentration out of people. Because if you're looking over my shoulder, I'm not going to open up a G chat window real quick. <laughs> because it's, like, what, what are you doing? And so it's one of these areas where there's been this unintended consequence. So, so uh, in places where pair programming works, you have the right sort of combination of skill levels and it's, and it's, you get rid of the other obstacles. It's, it's an example where sort of non-solitary deep work actually produces higher results. And so uh, that's why I would tell the extroverts is like, there's nothing solitary about it. But on the other hand, the things that create value in a competitive knowledge economy almost always do require intense concentration. So don't talk yourself into this idea that somehow just moving information around, like I'm just at the center of things, I'm moving emails back and forth, I'm talking to everyone, that that by itself is going to somehow uh, generate a lot of new value for the organization. It's really hard in more and more fields today to get around the reality that if you're not focusing your prefrontal cortex on an information flow to transform it into something of higher value, you're not producing a ton of value. So you can't escape the need to concentrate if you really want to be producing a lot of value in these sectors. So somebody that is working by themselves doesn't necessarily, that doesn't necessarily mean they're doing deep work. They could be just as easily distracted, but then switch that over to a, a group who has gotten together to work. Collaborative deep work is possible, in other words. Yeah, and actually, I love it, right? I mean, as long as you're concentrating intensely and not distracting yourself, I, I think where people get caught up is they say, well, if I, if I, Talk to someone, maybe that's distraction. But if, you, if you're talking about what you're working on, that's actually part of the concentration. And so it's completely fine. You know, yeah. the distraction is a context switch. So if you're not switching context and you're concentrating intensely, that's deep work. The number of people is somewhat incidental. So then the other side to that is actually having times where 
you're not doing deep work, but you are alone and your brain is still working. In other words, moving into times of, say, solitude. Right. There's only so much actual intense deep work you can you can get out of a day before your your brain is saying, OK, I've done enough. And I don't know if that's where you're going, but it's a point I want to make, which is, OK, there's this other piece, which is how do you recharge mm-hmm. A brain. How do you get a brain, you know, ready in the same way that if you have an expensive piece of factory equipment, how do you properly maintain it or cool it down? And something I've done a lot of research on recently is the role of solitude in that. And and solitude, I want to use a very specific definition, which is a definition. It, it comes from a, a book called Lead Yourself First that was written by uh, a actually Raymond Kethledge, who's a circuit court judge who was actually on the short list for the Supreme Court last week. But he's a circuit, he's a, a, a judge and he wrote it with an army officer and it's about solitude and its role in leadership. And they had this, I think, a very useful definition, which is solitude is freedom from inputs from other minds. And so it's not about, are you literally alone or are there people nearby? It's about, is there input from other minds in your minds? Are you listening to something, reading something, talking to someone, or is your mind just alone with its own thoughts, whether or not you're in a crowded coffee shop or on a cabin in the middle of the woods, right? And we have a lot of evidence that we need long periods of the solitude for our brain to recharge, for our brain to be able to produce deep thinking, but also just for our, our normal system functions uh, to work properly. That if you if you eliminate freedom from input from other minds, if you periods of that, if you eliminate that, from your life, there's a lot of negative consequences for your deep work, but other things as well. It's, it causes anxiety and other types of imbalance issues and makes it very difficult to concentrate. Um, so solitude is very important. And it's something that we're missing because if you have a mobile internet thing uh, in your pocket, you can banish those moments 100% from your life, which is pretty novel in the history of the human, human race. The fact that you could banish solitude 100% from your life uh, required massive technological miracle innovations <laughs> to make that <laughs> possible. Um, but it is very dangerous. It is very dangerous. So solitude, I think, outside of work and concentration, just time alone with your own mind, your own thoughts is uh, very, very important. Well, and I had to bring that up because, again, like you just said, with the devices and the screens and the technology of the especially specifically, especially the social media type. But but even texting, you know, something as lower, yep. you know, I, I, I see texting as a lesser evil than social media, but still not, you know, without distraction ability. And so I basically I'm seeing it on a spectrum. It's like, OK, deep works on one hand and solitudes on the other and in the middle, you've got shallowness that's enabled by the devices that keeps you from the left or the right, whichever one is on the left or right. It doesn't really matter. It's just you can't go deep or idle either way because you're in this constant hum of activity. Yeah, that's. I think that's a very interesting way to, to look at it, right, is that probably what we're more evolved for is this notion of like you, you spend periods and depth where you're concentrating on one thing. And then you have lots of periods in solitude, which our mind uses for lots of important internal bookkeeping and recharging. And then you had like the occasional periods of like, I'm talking to someone around the, the, you know, I'm, I'm in the village. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking to someone in the village. I'm back, you know, at the, I'm, I'm thinking back like in the ancient history. Right. And devices make it possible to basically banish both those things. That's where we spent the majority of our time. And now it's possible to be in a state where you do no sustained concentration and have no free and no true solitude. And it really is, is problematic, right? The, the, the problem with getting away from uh, intense concentration is, well, first of all, it kind of makes people miserable in the work environment. No one comes home enthusiastic or charged after a whole day of just frantic like emailing, <laughs> just sending messages back and forth all day, handling logistics that, that drains everyone because their brain's not meant for it. Uh, but more importantly, if you, if you get away from intense concentration and knowledge work, you're just, you're not getting better. You're not producing much things of real value. And you just have this sense of like, what am I doing? I, I can't wrap my mind around like what a value I'm producing. I think I'm just, I'm building PowerPoints and emailing. On the other hand, if you get rid of solitude, not only does it make you, you know, unhappy and bad at deep work, but we have a lot of compelling evidence now that it, that it really creates a sort of persistent state of anxiety. And the, the canary in the coal mine here is young people. So like you know, me and you, we maybe we use a phone too much, we text message, but we're not, people our age are not constantly on these things in the way that say like a 20 year old is, or a 19 year old is. Someone who grew up with smartphones as soon as they were like 12 or 13 years old had these, right? They, they have they have banished solitude from their life to a degree that uh, we haven't seen before in human history. And so they're a great test case. Let's take the, the young people, the so-called iGen, 
who, who have essentially completely banished solitude from their lives. And what do we see? The data is incredibly clear. Um, anxiety and anxiety-related disorders are off the charts, like literally off the charts. Jean Twin, she's one of the world's experts at demographic changes, has said she's never seen a, a demographic change as strong as the rise in anxiety among this particular generation versus other generations. And it's timed exactly to where we got to the point in that generation where they had smartphones. And so we, we and there's a lot of other uh, strands of evidence that have all kind of come to the same conclusion. I mean, people didn't want this to be the answer, but it almost certainly is the answer. And so this is the canary in the coal mine. We take a generation and say, let's get rid of all solitude from your life. You are never free from input from other minds and they are mental wrecks. And so that's the digital canary in the coal mine here in some sense that, you know, you get rid of solitude. Um, that's not good. Our brain was not meant to be continually bombarded with inputs from other minds. I wish your new book was out right now is all I can say. <laughs> Cause I think that's partly, I, I think you're proposing partly the fix for what, what we were just talking about, which is the, the basic lack of solitude as well as the lack of deep work. And so again, living in shallow at all times, it's just, it's not only boring, but it's unhealthy and, so anyway, so so open invitation. You're going to have to come back on when the book is out, so we can dive even deeper into this for sure. Oh yeah, we haven't even got into Aristotle yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll go there. We'll go. We'll go really deep. Pun intended. Abraham Lincoln's uh, next time. cottage where he went oh, for gosh. solitude. We haven't. Yeah, we have, yeah. Uh, Mister Money Mustache has a cameo in here. Come on, <laughs> it's a it's a it's a whole grab bag of <laughs> interestingness. Oh, that's awesome. So, uh, yeah. So, Cal, I mean, I guess that's kind of where we get, need to leave it, though, is let's let's kind of set up a cliffhanger. Um, the new book is going to come out next February, and uh, I'm sure you'll be here sometime <laughs> right right around January to record with me and and we'll talk about it and we'll di- we'll di- we'll dive in and it'll be. Yes, yeah, so I, this I think the good cliffhanger to leave it at is uh, there is something really broken about our relationship with technology, uh, both in work and our personal life. And I think deep work, which we talked about some today and last time, kind of gets at what's going on in the professional life. And in the personal life, we got at some of it here. But I'd like to leave like the idea with your listeners that uh, you don't have to accept the status quo. And you should start changing your mindset in such a way where you're you're at least willing to start asking big and provocative questions about, wait a second, what role do I really want technologies to play in my quest to build a really good and meaningful life? And, you know, sure, I have some answers that'll be in that book. But I think more importantly is people are starting to ask that question. And I think we have to do a lot of this self-reflection. Don't just accept, I don't know, like Ashton Kutzer used Instagram. I guess I should just have this on my phone. And, oh, look, I'm using this an hour a day. Don't let this stuff just steamroll into your life. Take back control. What do I want to do with my life? What's important to me? And decide for yourself how you're going to deploy technology to help that. Once you have that mindset, I think it really will change the way you think about your life and will open up lots of really positive changes. Yeah, uh, well said. And again, that's something that people need to start thinking about now and continue because it's it's not a OK, uh I've made my decision and now things are set in stone. No, this is an ongoing conversation because the speed of technology with this stuff is only going to pick up. Yeah, so. and, and the and the other quick <laughs> the other quick coda I'll add to it is um, tips aren't going to do it by themselves either. Mm-hmm. And I think we we've, we've learned this that the, the these issues are deep enough that just throwing random tips by itself won't work. Like, well, what if I take an internet? Sabbath? Or what if I have a rule about phones in bed? I am convinced that when you're thinking about how do I fix these issues in my life, you need a philosophy, a philosophy of living. This is my clear philosophy for what technology led into my life on what purposes and why. You can't just throw a bunch of hacks at it. You have to say, this is my coherent philosophy for technology and how I integrate into my life. You need something that is much stronger. So that, that's the other coda I will live uh, leave is adopt the mindset of I'm going to ask big questions and maybe make big changes. And two, I want a full philosophy in my life for here's the role technology plays. I know just good intentions and hacks won't be enough by themselves. It sounds like those tips and hacks are basically those fad diets. And instead, what we're talking about is you really need to figure out what is the lifestyle you want to lead. 
Exactly. I think you're exactly right. Yeah. The tip is like, whatever, don't eat, eat great fruits before whatever. <laughs> and the philosophy would be like, I'm a Mark Sisson primal guy. Like my whole life is built around, you know, whatever, getting the activities and foods that our ancestors ate or something, right? Like the idea of a fully formed philosophy for living, not just some tips on what you eat. The same thing I think is what we need with technology. I know I need that. I mean, the way that you're putting it, like, I, again, I think I have a semi-formed philosophy i do not have a fully formed one i need to work on that a bit more myself personally so if maybe only, if someone would write a book about one <laughs> <laughs> well said all right kel thank you so much for uh being back on the show and we'll talk to you again soon great thanks eric it's always fun to talk to cal and what you guys don't get to do is hear the pre and post conversation stuff but it is. It's always fun to talk with somebody who's kind of on that same wavelength of thinking about these things strategically, critically, when it comes to getting good work done, as well as living a good life and the, the role that technology does or does not play in those goals. So I highly encourage you to check out the show notes for this episode. Pick up the book Deep Work if you haven't already, as well as his other books. Not to mention, it's not too early to go pre-order his new book that's coming out in February. And yes, he's already locked in to come on the show and talk about that as well in about six months. And thanks again for listening, and I will see you next episode.